start the recording now. Okay, so welcome to the lecture on histology. Uh, I hope you're doing well. And before we proceed to the muscle tissue, which is our main topic today, let us make a brief revision of uh, the knowledge we acquired previously. Uh, please go to this web page, either using this QR code or this address, and there is a short quiz waiting for you. It will actually be simple questions, but they will be in the in more medical context. So the first problem here is that uh, you have a condition where the where the function of kinocelia is impaired. They do not work properly. Now type in which organs or organ functions would you presume to be to be damaged, to be impaired. Of course, you should know where the kinocelia occur. So just think about the consequences of this condition. And again, um, during the whole lecture, you can send your uh, questions to the chat and I will deal with that at the end. So let me trachea, lungs. Okay, so uh, the respiratory systems. Yes, uh, we we know that the kinocelia are lining are are on the epithelium lining the the uh, the nasal cavity. Uh, trachea, bronchi, and without the proper proper motility, uh, the passage of the mucus that covers the mucosa uh, doesn't work. So the patients are suffering from recurrent uh, respiratory infection because the bacteria are are growing in the in that mucus. Infertility, yes, and it's both in male as well as in female, because we, we know the kinocelia are present in the, in the oviduct, and they are also present in the uh, uh, afferent ductules of testis that are in the head of epididymis. Okay, I like the responses. So this condition really exists. Uh, it's called primary ciliary dyskinesia, or immotile ciliary syndrome and uh, here are the consequences of that the main problem would be the bronchial clearance of mucus and also it's somehow linked with the establishment of the right and left axis in the early embryo so if this is the notochord an embryonic structure in the early embryo uh, the left and so, uh, the left and right uh, symmetry is established probably also by the action of the kinocelia uh, that are on the on the cells lining uh, the primitive node which is which is uh, this this embryonic structure so there comes also situs inversus which is a reversal of the position of of some uh, internal body organs such as liver, heart, stomach, etc. This might be complete or incomplete. So there are also embryological consequences, right? Okay, next next problem would be here. Give examples of cells and organs, the vital functions of which are this this would be disturbed if you had very thick basal membrane in that organ. And think about the vital organs and vital functions only, okay? So are there some basal membranes part of any vital barriers in human body where having a too thick basal membrane would really be a problem for some vital functions? 
Okay, so feel free to type your responses and I will always, uh, when we have more, I will give comments on what is the right answer. I see the first one, alveoli. Yes, we know that the basal lamina of the alveolar epithelium is a part of the blood, a blood air barrier through which we are breathing. So alveoli is definitely uh, a good answer. Uh, pleura, I'm not aware of any problems with pleura in this context or blood vessels. And yes, uh, the nephron, uh, more specifically, is the glomerular filtration membrane. So it's the membrane of the inner epithelial layer of the so-called Baumann's capsule, okay? And the inner layer of the uh, Baumann's capsule is lined with cells called podocytes, and they are embracing the capillaries of the renal glomerulus. And this is part of the filtration barrier that separates the blood plasma uh, from the primary urine. And so remember the kidney and the lungs in this context. And again, this condition really exists. Uh, you will hear about it later in pathology and uh, internal medicine, or nephrology perhaps. And the thickening of the basal membrane really leads to problems. It's uh, mostly an immunologically induced disorder uh, where this barrier becomes thicker. And also in lungs, today with the kidney damage, it's called good, good posture syndrome, where the antigens are attacking the, uh, are uh, the are binding to the to, to the basal membrane in lungs and kidney, and uh, this is causing symptoms such as low volume of uh, urine, blood in the urine, losing proteins via the urine, or bleed lung bleeding. Okay, so this will cause re renal and respiratory failure. Great. You knew that. Now think about the epidermis. Uh, we know that we have desmosomes and hemidesmosomes there. What would happen if these uh, cell junctions would be disrupted in the epidermis, in the epithelium of epidermis? I'll give you a minute or two to think about that. So obviously we want you to be able to use this this knowledge from histology in some more uh, real context. Let me check your responses. Impaired signal transduction. Well, these desmosomes and hemidesmosomes are more involved in, they, they have more mechanical function, yeah? I'm not aware if they are somehow involved in the signal transaction in epidermis. I personally don't believe so. But yeah, less stability because they they, they have um, uh, they their task is to hold the cells together. Uh, necrosis of the skin. You're very close. It's actually forming cavities among the cells. You call it blisters, right? Failure to, of cell to cell adhesion, yes. And uh, actually, you call it blisters. The, the cells will become detached from each other if the dis desmosomes are involved. You will, and again, it's a really existing condition called pemphigus, and where the antibodies are attacking uh, components of the desmosomes. And the patients are suffering from large blisters in the in the epidermis. Uh, that's when the desmosomes are uh, involved, and uh, damaging uh, the hemidesmosomes that are attaching the cells to the basal membrane would 
result in formation of, of uh, other blisters, but like detaching the whole epidermis from the dermis. So it's about localization of the blisters. So you'll hear about more, more about that in dermatology and pathology, I believe. So remember from histology, the cell connections are there. And one more, we have this previously we have discussed the mechanism of, mechanisms of uh, of ossification. Now think about a condition where uh, the patient would have a mutation affecting the proper development of cartilage. Would there be some bones that still would develop normally? So obviously we are looking for bones, the development of which does not depend on uh, a cartilage model of, of, of these bones. So sternum and skull. Sternum originates uh, via the des uh, chondrogenous ossification. So, and skull is to, is to uh, it's very general. We need to answer the, the skull in more detail. Yes, mandible and maxilla. The upper and lower jaw are bones that are ossifying via, via the desmogenous ossification. That means they don't need any previous cartilage model of bone, so they will develop normally. Yeah, flat, bone of, flat bones of the skull, very good. And clavicle, yes. Uh, these are good questions. So the, so, the, so the flat bones of the skull vault, they also are made. Uh, they, they originate via desmogenous ossification. And again, this condition really exists. Um, actually, it's a whole a group of the diseases with different genetic ba background. Uh, they are called achondroplasia. There's a typo here, achondroplasia or chondrodystrophy. And uh, it affects the bones that uh, uh, that uh, are are developing via the chondrogenous ossification. So the result is a dwarfism, but some bones are of normal size, such as the maxilla and mandible, and the flat bones of the skull. While the uh, the uh, chondrocranium, which is part of the skull, that ossifies the ossification of which is based on cartilage, that means that's, that's the basis of the skull, so the body of the sphenoid, the petrous bone, and uh, which uh, and the and the and the body of the of the occipital bone surrounding the foramen magnum, these are made of cartilage. So these are rather hypoplastic, smaller than expected. Okay. Well, uh, let's proceed to the, to, to the top, new topic we got today. It's muscle tissue. So what makes muscle a muscle? Uh, muscle tissue is contractile. So it, express, it does express uh, contractile my, uh, myofilaments that interact with each other and uh, making the cells or fibers shorter. So contractility. It's also excitable, so it's able to, to carry and propagate some uh, electric changes on the membrane called action potential. The intermediate filament, uh, as you might recall from the classification of tissues at the beginning, intermediate filament, uh, typical for the cytoskeleton of muscle, is desmin. It's used in some histochemical methods. We need to identify the origin of, 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 the, of some cells. And the, um, uh, from the embryonic perspective, it develops from mesoderm or mesenchyme. We got two categories. It's smooth or striated. What's the difference? In smooth muscle, uh, there are no uh, regular patterns how the contractile myofilaments are organized. In striated muscle, the contractile filaments are organized in repeating units called sarcomeres. So striated, also called sarcomeric, because the presence of the sarcomere and the regular um, arrangement 
appears as striation in the, in the, in the microscope. And uh, there are two types of striated muscle. It's skeletal striated and cardiac striated muscle. So let's go uh, through the skeletal muscle at first. And then uh, I will have some notes on uh, differences, uh, uh, what's different in cardiac or smooth muscle. So if you approach the skeletal muscle from the macroscopic view, as you are used in, from anatomy perhaps, the connective tissue layer that uh, forms an envelope of the whole muscle belly perhaps is the epimysium. Now the muscle consists of some fibrillar components that could be dissected using a scalpel. These are uh, bundles of muscle fibers. Each bundle uh, is, uh, has its own uh, connective tissue envelope called perimysium. And if you would use a microscope and look inside of these bundles, you would realize that each bundle contains long skeletal muscle fibers. Each fiber uh, has uh, basal lamina that surrounds each fiber, and there is a fine connective tissue among the fibers. It's called endomysium. Now, the, uh, this connective tissue contains the finest branches of blood vessels and nerves. Now, let's have a look on the single skeletal muscle fiber in longitudinal section and in cross section. You would realize that uh, there are more nuclei, there might be tens of nuclei per fiber. Uh, they are always on the periphery below the sarcolemma. Now, what is the sarcolemma? Sarcolemma is a special word used for the complex of the cell membrane and the basal lamina here. You would hear the word sarco many times here in the context of the skeletal muscle, because as I was explained, um, it uh, comes from Greek and it you can translate it like a flesh. So uh, it's sarcolemma. In cross-section, you would realize the nuclei on the periphery and inside the sarcoplasm, which is just another word for the cytoplasm here, you would realize some myofibrils. Even in the routine sections, uh, in the practical uh, classes, you would be able to see some uh, stri striated pattern consisting of dark A bands and lighter I bands. Now these letters a and I come from the optical, or derived from the optical properties of this uh, part uh, from the optical and isotropic or isotropic uh, properties. Isotropic in this context means having the same properties in all directions related to the, to the uh, illuminating light you are using for, for the microscopic observation. I bands are darker, I bands are lighter. Well, why do these fibers have more nuclei? We need to go into embryology for a while because they originate by fusion of uh, multiple embryonic cells called embryonic myoblasts. The intermediate stage is called the myotube. It's already a multinucleated uh, object called syncytium. And it, as it differentiates, the nuclei are moving to the periphery and the cross striation appears. Some cells from these embryonic times remain undifferentiated. They are called myosatellite cells. They occur sometimes uh, uh, below the same basal lamina, and it's believed they might somehow contribute to, to partial regeneration of muscle, especially uh, at younger age. But unfortunately, the regeneration of, of skeletal muscle is very, very poor. Uh, in adults, in, in, in mammals especially. If you would look more closely on the inner structure, uh, on the background of this uh, striation pattern, you would realize that there are, the, there are repeating units of the contractile apparatus. These units are called sarcomeres. Length of each sarcomere is roughly 2.5 micrometers. The borders of the sarcomere are called the Z-lines. It comes from German Zwischenlinie, 
And so Z line is a glycoprotein, uh, glycoprotein uh, band into which the thin myofilaments, here drawn as blue, the actin myofilaments are attached from both on uh, both sides. But here there will be already different sarcomere. Let's stay inside this example sarcomere. Uh, we have also thick myofilaments uh, made of a protein called myosin and they are stabilized, the very myosin molecules are stabilized in the center by other proteins that appear in the microscope as the so-called M-line. So we have lots of letters. A band is made of or consists of the overlapping actin and myosin filaments. So that's the dark A band. The I band, the light one, consists of actin only on both sides of the Z line. The H band inside um, is in the region where we have only myosin, no actin. And the M line is the connecting stripe in the middle. So we got familiar with two uh, microfilaments, with the thin actin microfilaments and with the thick myosin microfilaments. We need to look a little bit closer on the structure of these to ex explain the, the interaction between these filaments, to explain the contraction. So each of these uh, actin microfilaments is actually a double helix uh, polymerized from uh, single globular actin molecules. So if you hear G actin, it means a single actin molecule. Uh, but these uh, molecules have a tendency to polymerize into two helices. So that's what we call fibrillar actin. So this is one fiber of the fibrillar actin. The actin has a binding site uh, that is able to bind the head of the myosin molecule. However, the binding site is blocked by another protein that is wrapped, wrapped around, like a ribbon, is wrapped around the actin. This protein is called tropomyosin, and it blocks the, it prevents the myosin from binding to actin. And there is another protein made of three subunits, it's called troponin. The three subunits are T, I, C subunits, and it's attached to the tropomyosin. Now, in, in the first approach, we need to understand that if the calcium, that is a, a, it's a signal that triggers the contraction inside the fiber, the calcium ions are binding the troponin C subunit. That's why the troponin C is called C, because it binds, it binds calcium. A consequence of this is a change of the uh, conformation of that molecule that pull, literally pulls away the tropomyosin, and therefore the tropomyosin does not block the interaction between actin and myosin anymore. So the myosin can bind to, action, to actin and a co contraction might occur. The myosin hat uh, has also an enzymatic activity. It's an ATPase. It's able to bind and cleave the ATP. To explain uh, the contraction, uh, we need we need some more details. Uh, let's look in. Let's have a look inside the fiber, and uh, we have uh, the myofibrils uh, inside. We have the sarcolemma, the membrane. And you would notice that the sarcolemma contains some invaginations that go deeper inside the, the sarcoplasm. From the surface, it appears as small tunnels. And in a cross section, you would see it, there are really invaginations that go deep inside. They are accompanied by terminal dilated parts of um, uh, endoplasmic reticulum. Now, this smooth endoplasmic reticulum is called sarcoplasmic reticulum in, 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 in muscle fibers. And uh, it accumulates uh, the calcium ions. Each turn transversal tubule, T or transversal tubule, is accompanied by a pair 
of these uh, dilated parts or cisterns of sarcoplasmic reticulum, and that's called a triad. Two plus one makes three. If you look uh, on this region in more detail here, we need to explain at least uh, in a simplified way uh, how is the contraction initiated. Now this will be in much more details discussed in second year in physiology. Uh, but for, for the purpose of histology, uh, the simple version would be like that. Uh, we said that uh, muscle, muscle tissue is excitable, right? That means uh, it has the ability to, to generate and propagate action potential. Action potential is a, is a repeatable stereotype change of uh, uh, the electrical conditions on both sides of the membrane. Uh, in the resting state, when nothing is happening, no action potential, there is an inequilibrium on, uh, in the concent concentration of ions on both sides of the membrane. Here is the outer space and here is the inner space, right? The, this inequilibrium is, is a consequence of activity of ion pumps, proteins that are pumping ions outside, inside. The most important of which is the so-called sodium potassium ATPase. It was also the first ion pump that was discovered and uh, studied thoroughly. And it basically takes three sodium cations out from inside to outside in exchange of two potassium uh, cations that go inside. And you can feel that there's an equilibrium, uh, so more positively charged particles accumulate outside than inside. And you could really, you could literally measure it if you have microscopic electrodes, you pull one electrode you inside, another outside the membrane, and you would you really can measure uh, something like minus 70 millivolts uh, potential or voltage difference between these two potential electric potentials. This is called resting potential. Now, when the activity is triggered, uh, there is action potential, which is a kind of a re reversal of this of this uh, electrical uh, charges because some other ions or channels are opening. Uh, we don't go into details for now. I want only to point out that this electric activity travels along the sarcolemma and this impulse skips on the membrane of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which responds um, by releasing the calcium uh, cations that were, have, have been stored inside. It, they are now released into the, into the sarcoplasm. In the resting state, most of the calcium is kept safely inside the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Once the calcium is released, it triggers the contraction by binding to the troponin, as we already explained. Now, when the interaction between myosin and actin is made possible, let's go to the steps explaining the, the, the interaction. I have divided it into five steps. In the first, we have the myosin hat attached to the actin. So this is one of the actin fibers. This is the one of the myosin heads. In the second step, uh, ATP, adenosine trisphosphate, binds the, to the myosin. As a consequence, the myosin head is released from the actin. In next step, the ATP undergoes hydrolysis. That's the enzymatic activity of the myosin head. And we got ADP plus the phosphate plus some energy released from that hydrolysis. And this energy, this chemical energy is used to, to a movement of the myosin head, the change of this angle. So the myosin head really makes this, this movement here in that angle. In the next step, the phosphate is released uh, and the myosin binds to the actin again, but this time to the next binding site. And in the fifth step, uh, 
there is a, a change in this angle again and the potential energy of the Marsden hat is used to generate the so-called power stroke. So uh, the whole Marsden is, is sliding along the axis, and it's the is the is the is the force generating generating step. So if you compare the step five with the step one, it's actually the same one. So this process could be repeated again and again, but this time the Marsden hat has moved forward like one step. If this process occurs simultaneously in millions and millions of molecules, we have a almost continuous movement resulting from these steps. One more point, you can see that uh, we need the ATP to detach the myosin from the actin. If there is no ATP, such as uh, after death, when we die, we don't produce ATP anymore, the myosin stays here in the step one, firmly bound to the release, and it's called the post-mortem rigor of the muscles, or in Latin, it's rigor mortis. It's, it's the stiffness of the muscles after death without ATP, which, uh, which is relaxed only after hydrolysis of these proteins. So we need, we need to be able to explain, at least brief, in this simplified way, how uh, the, the contraction happens. Try to compare the relaxed sarcomere and the contracted sarcomere. Now the relaxed sarcomere had some like 2.5 micrometers, but it can contract. The contraction has its limits uh, because uh, there are some more proteins between the Z lines and they cannot overlap. Uh, the H band, that's where the, only the myosin was, it disappears because the opposite actin um, myofilaments come close to each other. And uh, there is one more protein here called Tichin. It works as, as a spring. So by compressing, by, by contracting the sarcomere, you are compressing the tichin. And it helps during the opposite process, during the reverse process, during the relaxation to, 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 to get to that, to that relaxed condition of the sarcomere again. We have various types of muscle fibers in human body. They are specialized to, to, to various regimes uh, or activity. Let's start with a type one. Um, they, are, they have a slow initiation of their activity, but uh, they don't fatigue easily. They, uh, they have a lots of endurance. And they are also called red because they contain lots of myoglobin. Well, myoglobin is a, is a hemoprotein um, uh, kind of similar to hemoglobin. It also binds oxygen, but myoglobin uh, binds the oxygen that makes the reserve of oxygen in, in muscle, right? So these red fibers have lots of myoglobin and lots of mitochondria. They are specialized to oxidative phosphorylation. As you recall from biochemistry, perhaps, this is the most efficient uh, process how to get most energy from a molecule of, let's say, from a glucose molecule. Because the products, the degradation products, are simple molecules without no more energy, and the, you have plenty of ATP there. So that's why they uh, are fatigue resistant. The opposite are type 2B muscle fibers. They are very fast. They can make this fast explosive contractions, but they get tired uh, soon. They are also called white because they contain less myoglobin and less mitochondria. From the biochemical point of view, they are more specialized to glycolysis, uh, which, uh, which does not require oxygen. So they can work on the so-called oxygen debt, which needs to be paid lately, uh, later on. But at the moment, no oxygen is needed. But the product of that uh, glycolysis is the lactic acid and only few ATP molecules. The lactic acid, if it stays in the muscle, it lowers the pH 
it induces the acidosis in the muscle and that that's something we perceive as muscle pain and even cramps if the blood flow is not able to wash the lactic acid away and we have also type 2a fibers that are like something in between now various muscles of of, of our body have various proportions of these fibers think about the muscles that need need to be very, to have very rapid contraction and get but get easily tired for example the muscles that move your eyeball yeah are very 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 fast sorry very fast and they get uh, they get tired easily or the muscles uh, uh, train in a trained sprinter that is running 100 meters uh, that's these fibers. Muscles that that are not required to make any fast contractions, such as um, muscles surrounding the vertebral column, the the uh, intervertebral muscles, they need to stay to, to hold the, the 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 tension during the whole day. Uh, they are made of uh, slow red muscles uh, fibers even if you if you need if you eat a fish or a chicken you can notice that some muscles uh, along the vertebral column are really darker here is the explanation right these are the slow and red muscles let's let, explain how the muscle fibers is activated um, it receives instructions from uh, nerves uh, that are called motor neurons and each motor neuron has a process that goes to the periphery, takes the information to the muscle. This is called axon. And the action potential, this electric activity, is somehow transferred from the nerve to the muscle. Now, the terminal part of this axon is dilated. It contains uh, synaptic vesicles because this whole is called neuromuscular synapse or motor and plate which is the same and inside these vesicles we have molecules called neurotransmitters the neurotransmitter on this motor and plate is a molecule called acetylcholine upon uh, activation by the action potential the synaptic vesicles are releasing the neurotransmitter into this microscopic space called synapt synaptic cleft and uh, on the other membrane, on the opposite membrane, which is called post-synaptic membrane, we got receptors, the acetylcholine receptors, which once binding the acetylcholine are carrying the information uh, to the sarcolemma and are causing uh, activation of the sarcolemma and all the, all the uh, electric changes we have discussed. So, uh, what is a motor unit in the human body it's quite an important complex uh, uh, concept uh, how the nerves are innervating various muscles think about a single motor neuron that is in the anterior horns of the spinal cord and this motor neuron is sending an axon right so all the muscle fibers innervated by that axon are called together with the motor neuron are called one motor unit. This is a useful concept to explain the uh, the ability to to make very precise movements, because some muscles in the human body have very small motor units. Uh, each motor neuron innervates only one or two muscle fibers. With this precise innervation pattern, you can perform very, very precise and fine movements because you are controlling every two or three muscle fibers in, in, in an independent way. So that's, for example, the eyeball muscles. Yeah, all the muscles are of our hands. They have very small motor units, unlike. Other muscles of, of the body, such as the latissimus dorsi or the gluteus maximus muscle, 
you don't expect too much too much coordination from these muscles so they have large motor units one one axon is innervated a whole a large population of muscle fibers at once uh, our central nervous system uh, needs to be informed about the the about the, how the muscles are stretched we need to explain uh, one of the stretch receptors that performs this it's called muscle spindle now the latin word for spindle is fusus we need that word because it be, it appears in part of the terminology and the muscle spindle is a stretch receptor that is inside our muscles it's parallel or serial to the to the other uh, let us say normal working uh, uh, muscle fibers these normal muscle fibers we already are familiar with are called extra fusal because they are extra they are, they are outside this muscle spindle so most of our muscle fibers are extra fusal they are innervated via the axon that belongs to a motor neuron that sits in the anterior horns of the of the spinal cord gray matter so this is gray matter with the dorsal horns or posterior horns and the anterior horns these motor neurons that are innervating the extra fusal skeletal muscle fibers are known as the alpha motor neuron and we know they end with a motor end plate okay now let us say the muscle is stretched okay or contracts whatever this uh, deformation is is perceived uh, via these uh, afferent uh, nerve fibers that are wrapped around small muscle fibers that are inside the muscle spindle that's why we call them intrafusal they are inside so the deformation here is uh, is is perceived via this nerve fiber it's a dendrite so it's a process that carries the information to the central nervous system it belongs to a neuron the body of which is sitting in the spinal ganglia it's a sensory neuron in the spinal ganglia the axon carries then this information into the posterior horns of the spinal cord and here there are many options how it can interpolate with other cells in the most simple pattern it it interpolates with the motor neuron that is causing the contraction that would be a monosynaptic reflex however it could go to the uh, to the contralateral uh, part of the sp gray gray matter it could go one it could go one or more levels uh, up um, cranially or caudally in the in the uh, spinal cord segments can go wherever now the 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 sensitivity of this receptor is modulated via gamma motor neurons that are also sitting in the anterior horns of the gray matter and they are sending their axons to innervate the these intrafusal muscle fibers but the fibers are very thin and they do not generate for much force by themselves this innervation rather serves uh, as, the, as a modulation mo modulation of the of the sensitivity of these fibers because you can imagine we have muscles that uh, generate forces uh, in the order of milli newtons very small forces forces little forces and if you carry something that weighs 30 kilograms you are generating force in the order of of hundreds of newtons so to 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 make it work in such a, such a wide range of sensitivity this receptor has a modulated sensitivity via the gamma motor neurons and in neurology and physiology you will discuss and develop this idea in more detail now for for histology you need to know these muscle spindles exist and, and what are they made of and how they are connected in this uh, simple simple connection or wiring pattern um, let's have a look on the cardiac muscle what's similar what's different here the cardiac muscle is made of uh, uh, cardiac muscle cells uh, cardiac myocytes also 
article. They are striated, yes, they are, because um, they also have contractile apparatus organized into sarcomeres. Again, there is a basal lamina uh, as an envelope of each cardiac muscle cell. The nucleus here is always in the center. Exceptionally, there might be two nuclei, but mostly there is a single nucleus. It's in the center. So that's how it would like in a cross section. It, this is longitudinally, it is a cross section cell. Where two cardiac muscle cells are touching each other, they might have this slightly branching pattern. They are special regions called intercalated discs. Now, the intercalated disc is an accumulation of cell-to-cell um, -cell junctions. Here is a detail of this, of this uh, disc. Uh, the, here is uh, one cardiac mouse side, here is another one, and their membranes are touching. Uh, they are uh, the adherent, the adherence junctions they are responsible for mechanical cohesion of the cells. So if this cell contracts and this one contracts, they, all, they stay together. So to transmit the mechanical forces. And they are also cell junctions, uh, the so-called gap junctions or nexus, the function of which is to, is to let small molecules and charged particles ions to pass from the sarcoplasm of one cell to another cell and vice versa. So they are electrically coupling the cytoplasm of the cells. So cardiac myocytes that are connected via the uh, gap junctions are together electrically connected and they work as, a, as an electrical continuum, as a single unit, because the potentials and electrical changes can immediately, uh, uh, immediately pass from one cell to another. So the density of the gap, junction, gap junctions and their, whether they are opened or closed, it affects the, the conductile properties of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the cardiac muscle tissue. Let's go back to the cell. Uh, on the poles of the nuclei, you can sometimes find an endogenous pigment. It's called lipofuscin. It's a result of an imperfect uh, recycling of, uh, of the uh, proteins and membranes and organelles. Uh, well, the cardiac mouse cells are long living cells. They mostly live, they have a very poor or no re regeneration capacity and they, they don't stop for the whole life. And as we age, they are accumulating this, this pigment on the poles of the nucleus. It's also called wear and tear pigment. As a result of this, uh, the whole myocardium uh, is a little bit darker in adults and in elderly persons. If you would take a heart of, uh, of an elderly patient and you will cut it, you would look, you would, you would see that the myocardium is like more brownish than a myocardium of, of an infant, of a child. I believe in your pathology classes in third year, you will have the opportunity to see that, to, to, to see that literally because it's part of the pathological dissection. The cardiac muscle cells, they form kind of a network and in, in the gaps in between, we have a fine collagenous uh, reticular connective tissue called endomysium. It contains many capillaries and nerves. Uh, and the capillary bed is very rich very dense in the myocardium. The myocardium dep strongly depends on, on a sufficient, uh, sufficient uh, oxygen supply. If you, you, you would look more closely into the uh, wall of the, of the heart ventricles, left and right ventricle, and you would look in the uh, region below the endocardium, you would find out that there are some diff somehow different uh, muscle cells, cardiac muscle cells. They are called Purkinje fibers, but actually they are not fibers. These are cells, but it, it's, it's, it's an official terminology that might be misleading, but it's a, from historical reasons that have been named like this, Purkinje fibers. But these are actually cardiac muscle cells that are specialized not for generating force, 
but for conducting the electric activity because it's the terminal part of what you know as, as the cardiac conducting system. Yeah, it consists of the of the sinoatrial node, atrioventricular node, bundle of his, uh, uh, Tavares uh, uh, branches, uh, bundles, and so on. The terminal part in the ventricles that needs to distribute the electric electric activity in a synchronized way throughout the whole myocardium of the ventricles, it's called prokinia fibers. In the microscope, they have they are larger than the normal working myocardium and they have a pale sarcoplasm because they, they contain less contractile myofilaments but more glycogen. That's why they do not stain. And they are responsible for for initiating the contraction at the right moment, at the right place. So the whole ventricle would work as an efficient pump. Okay, this the contraction doesn't need to be chaotic. It needs to be perfectly organized. Where to, where does the contraction start? Close to the apex of the heart, and where does it propagate to? Prokinia fibers. So a few differences in the smooth muscle. The first difference is that uh, it's made of smooth muscle cells. Another word for this is leiomyocytes. I believe you will you will you will hear that word in pathology again because there are tumors uh, from these smooth muscle cells called leiomyomas. So the word tells you where does it come from? Yeah, from smooth muscle cells. There is a sing single nucleus. It's always in the center. That is how it appears on the longitudinal section. That's how it appears on the cross section. In most organs of the human body uh, that have smooth muscle, the smooth muscle cells are connected with each other via the gap junctions, junctions. So again, they mostly work as electric unit in the intestines, for example, in the bronchi, in the ureter, in the urinary bladder. Uh, only exceptionally, uh, some smooth muscle cell populations, such as the, the, the smooth muscle cells of the iris, uh, are not connected and they work more independently, being capable of very precise contractions. Well, uh, each of the smooth muscle cell has mostly an irregular shape in histological preparations. They have even small cavities um, uh, that reflect the ability to, to uh, perform endocytosis or exocytosis that are called caveolae. A singular will be caveola, more caveolae, it's Latin. And there is a single nucleus in the center. The nucleus has, uh, has uh, these uh, ovoid uh, edges, round edges, not sharp like uh, fibroblasts or fibrocytes. They are, there is some uh, granular endoplasmic reticulum and Golgi complex because some, in some organs, the, cell, the smooth muscle cells are able to produce extracellular metrics, such as in blood vessels. So most of the collagen and elastin we, we got in, 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 uh, in our arteries, our veins, have been produced by smooth muscle cells. But their main function is to contract and the contractile apparatus is organized, uh, uh, it's actually less organized <laughs> than in the sarcomeric muscle. There are no sarcomeres. The actin, drawn in blue here, attaches to the uh, dense plaques. These are glycoprotein plates in, in, the, in the cell membrane. And also dense bodies, which are similar plates inside the, uh, the cytoplasm. So it's similar to the Z lines, but it's called dense bodies and dense plaques. Among the actin, we have the myosin. The actin and myosin molecules are slightly different from the actin and myosin in the sarcomic muscle, but it's still some kind of actin and myosin. We got the basal lamina envelope, and uh, this uh, contractile apparatus runs in various direct possible directions in three dimensions through the cell. 
So the contraction results in this change of shape and these uh, smooth muscle cells are able to contract even more than relatively to their rest resting state length than, than the skeletal muscle would be able. They can contract even more. The mechanism of the contraction is different here. We don't have any tropomyosin, we don't have any troponin here. It's a, a complex process that will be discussed in second year physiology in more detail. Now for the histology exam and for, for the first look, you need to know that it's initiated again by the calcium ions, but this time they don't bind to troponin. There is no troponin here in small muscle. Instead, there is a protein, uh, the activity of which is modulated by calcium. That's why it's called calmodulin. It becomes activated by the calcium. The activated calmodulin um, uh, facilitates uh, the activation of an enzyme called myosin kinase. And the myosin kinase uh, transfers the phosphate group to myosin in the next step. So it's a whole cascade, right? So this phosphate is carried by that myosin kinase enzyme, the result of which is a phosphorylated myosin, which is already an active form of myosin that binds to actin and the contraction may, might occur. So this is a simplification of the process, but we know it's different, right? Now uh, I will go through some better pictures, 3D schemes and microscope uh, schemes of the, of, of, the, of the same. And I hope you will, you will understand it better once we went through the simplified schemes. So the occurrence in the, hum, in the human body is obvious. You know where the skeletal muscle are, is, you know where the cardiac muscle is. And you also know from anatomy where the smooth muscle is distributed in the in the human body that's what you see with the microscope uh, uh, you can see the skeletal muscle and the nuclei are on the on the on the periphery here inside you can see the myofibrils the pattern of the myofibrils and uh, this is the hierarchy of the whole muscle fascicle, single muscle fiber, and it's myofilaments. With, sorry, myofibrils. The myofibrils are arrangement of the myofilaments. Myofibrils run through the whole length of the muscle fiber. And the myofibrils are made of thin actin myofilaments and thick myosin myofilaments. We go to the circle lemma here, right? Uh, this is just to remind of remind you of the fact that uh, the final multinucleated uh, mus skeletal muscle fiber originates by fusion of the embryonic myoblast. Here is the whole process of the maturation. This is the prenatal prenatal uh, maturation where your muscles already are able to contract. Uh, the cross striation uh, that helps you to identify the, the, the skeletal muscle is visible only when you have longitudinal section. So here you can see the dark uh, A bands and the lighter I bands and longitudinal section. If you have a cross section, you don't see any cross striation, right? You just need to rely on the position of the nuclei. That's a very, very reliable sign that helps you to differentiate skeletal muscle. And if you need to see the sarcomeres in detail, you already need the electron microscopy, which is the, the, big, the, the, the micrograph below. This scheme is a three-dimensional reconstruction of the transverse tubules and the accompanying uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum cisterns. And you can perhaps better understand why this is called a triate because this transversal tubule, which is an invagination of the plasma membrane inside the cells, it carries the electric activity deep inside to all the myofibrils, yeah? And all, all, all this surface is available, is, 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 it does interact with, with the smooth muscle, with the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So the contraction may occur at once 
at once in the whole volume. So this helps to distribute the signal inside the, the, the fiber. This is how you see uh, the cross striation in the light microscope. And this is what you see in more detail in the optical microscope. You can see the Z line here in the middle of the I band. This is a correlation between light microscopy and electromicroscopy. Again, the nuclei are on the periphery. There is a nerve here, right? In the in the endomysium connective tissue, and there are capillaries here in the endomysium. Again, here are the capillaries, and here are the nerves. So everybody should be able to explain the components of the of the uh, sarcomere, starting from one disc, ending with another uh, Z disc. So between two Z plates or Z discs. In the sarcomere. Here is the the H band made of myosin only, the M line, the anisotropic darker and the isotropic lighter band. The myosin molecule uh, looks like a golf club, and it it has a it has a, a tail and a head. The head has this enzymatic activity that binds ATP and interacts with F, with fibrillar actin. Here is that titian molecule that works as a spring during contraction that helps to relax. And we can see there are literally thousands and millions of uh, these actin myosin interactions in each fiber and each muscle. Here is that pattern of the thick myosin uh, myofilaments and the thin, these are the small dots, act in myofilaments. And there is a regular pat hexagonal pattern there. We know that the troponin binds the calcium and detaches the tropomyosin from the actin. You need to remember the troponin because, uh, for example, the troponin of the cardiac muscle is used nowadays uh, as a part of the biochemical diagnosis of the infarction of myocardium. Because when you, when you measure the elevated uh, troponin in the blood plasma, it's obvious it must have come from damaged cardiac muscle cells. And using the benefit of the, of, of the molecular differences, of knowing the molecular differences be between the cardiac troponin and the skeletal muscle troponin, you can tell specifically that the troponin in the patient's blood plasma must have come from the, from the, from dying uh, cardiac muscle cells. And this is an animation showing one of the myosin heads walking around the, uh, the F actin. So the orange balls, that's the uh, globular actin polymerized into this double helix of the fibrillar actin. Uh, the dark blue band, it's tropomyosin that is normally blocking the, the, the binding sites of, uh, on actin. This uh, three subunits belong to, the purple three subunits belong to troponin. And you can see how the C subunit of the troponin binds the calcium, which is the yellow ball coming from, from this direction. And then it makes space for the myosin head. And the myosin binds the ATP, which is the, the green ball here that is hydrolyzed to ADP and phosphate. And this uh, gray cone, it's magnesium. It's, it's one of the other cofactors that are necessary for the contraction. Okay, uh, this is to illustrate that uh, the fiber types we have revised really exist. Uh, you can visualize it uh, when you when you uh, stain the fibers for some enzymes of the uh, of the Krebs cycle. Uh, so this this is the a succinate dehydrogenase staining. Uh, it's one of the enzymes of the 
citrate cycle or Krebs cycle. And you can see the most positive reaction is in the slow fatigue resistant red fibers that are specialized to uh, oxidative phosphorylation. So different athletes would have different proportions of this muscle. There's a sprinter with predominating type two fibers. And this is a marathon runner with type one and type two fibers that last long, are slower, but fatigue resistant, right? More relying on the oxidative phosphorylation. And this is really the proof uh, how you can how you can visualize these uh, these enzymes. So, well, the message here is the take home message is different muscle fibers have different enzymes that and work in, in, in different regime. This is a three dimensional reconstruction of the motor end plate with more details. You can see the, 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 the synaptic vesicles here that are releasing the neurotransmitter into, into the synaptic cleft where we have the acetylcholine receptors uh, and uh, yeah, that's it. And this is reality, how you, how you can see it in reality. Here is the axon terminal with mitochondria because the transport processes here require lots of energy. energy. And this are the ju junctional folds and this is already muscle fiber. And here is the synaptic cleft, okay? We need to be aware of this connection because uh, it's important in medicine. There are several processes that can uh, that can uh, affect the trans transmission of the of the activity from nerves to muscles. Think about some toxins, such as the toxin of the bacterium ca called Clostridium botulinum. It's called a botulinum toxin, and it, this why is it toxic? Because it prevents the release of uh, the neurotransmitter here. So although there is an the motor neurons are sending instructions to the muscle. There is no response in the muscle because it doesn't receive that signal. And when this comes to the, to the diaphragm as the main muscle used for breathing, the, patient, the, the, the individual dies uh, because it's, it, uh, it, it, he or she cannot breathe, right? Another, another toxic substance is the uh, Curare, which is uh, one of the natural substances used as as a uh, arrow poison, uh, and there is a different mechanism here. It binds to the acetylcholine receptors, so the acetylcholine cannot bind here. So it pre it it induces paralysis of the muscle. This is uh, mimicked by some of uh, some drugs that are used in, in pharmacology or uh, in anesthesiology uh, to, to induce uh, relaxation of muscle. You will hear about similar molecules in the, in the future. Also, you will hear in neurology about a condition called myasthenia gravis, which is uh, a condition where the muscles are e very easily fatigable they are very weak and it's a condition where the body is producing antibodies that bind these receptors, these acetylcholine receptors, so they are not available for the acetylcholine itself. So again, this transmission of the activity from the nerve to the muscle is impaired. It's called myasthenia gravis. Well, uh, this is to uh, show the, myo the myotubes and the satellite cells that perceive, however, uh, these precursor cells uh, uh, have some differential potential in, in the future, but actually little is known about that. But here they are, they really exist, next to the muscle fiber. The muscle fiber already has the myofibrils, the sat satellite cell does not. And here is the 
the connection between the muscle and the tendon. So we know that both the origin and the insertion of muscle needs a tendon. And you can see that the connective tissue, our collagen, the, mainly the collagen of the endomysium, continuous, continuously uh, goes further as the collagen of the tendon. So there is no sharp border here. It's a continuous uh, connection between these two tissues. It's very, it's very firm. It's 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 very, very robust. And again, the collagen of the tendon goes and the, into the perichondrium, into the superficial compact bone, as the becoming the sharpest fibers. So there is a continuous connection between the bone through the tendon to the endomysium of the muscle. And if you remember, we discussed these stretch, stretch receptors called, uh, uh, called muscle spindles. Here it is, one of the muscle spindles with one, two, three intrafusal muscle fibers. You can see they are smaller, thinner than the real working muscle fibers, the extrafusal muscle fibers. And here is uh, capillary, perhaps. And we already know they work as stretch receptors. This is a reconstruction of uh, the cardiac muscle. Here is a light microscopy picture. You can see the intercalated discs as the dark inter uh, zones here. And here is a reconstruction of this. Um, it has this shape which increases the mutual surface. And we can see the fascia adher adherence, the desmosome or macular adherence, and the gap junctions being situated there, electrically coupling the adjacent cell. Two pictures from the light microscope, longitudinal section through the cardiac muscle in, with intercalated discs. You can see the nuclei are in the center but always make sure you look at more nuclei. Don't be satisfied with the first one you find. You can see the very rich capillary network. All these are red blood cells inside capillaries. So you can have an idea that it, actually every uh, uh, cardiac muscle cell has a capillary somewhere in the neighborhood. And this is a cross section. You know that the, or, that the orientation of uh, cardiac muscle is in various directions in, in the human heart. So if you make one histological section, you can easily see longitudinal, transversal, or oblique sections, uh, whatever. So in, in the tra transversal section, you can see the nucleus here is inside. All right. Don't be satisfied with the first one nucleus that you find, but look for more and then make your judgment. Because sometimes you can have oblique sections or something like that. Look at more. Here are typical central positions of the nuclei in the cardiac muscle cells. This is an arterial running through the myocardium. Um, there is uh, the, the, the sarcoplasmic reticulum in the cardiac muscle is less rich. So uh, there is each transversal tubule is accompanied by a single row of cisterns of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. They are not two. So it's one plus one, which makes two, and that's called a dyad. Okay, one terminal cistern and one T tubule. And the mechanism is here the same. The action potential skips to the endoplasmic reticulum and it releases calcium that triggers the contraction. So here is one of the uh, intercalated discs in an electron microscope. You can see the fascia adherence. You can see the desmosome or the macular adher adherence. And on these side regions, there are the gap junctions. There are plenty of mitochondria there in the cardiac muscle. And here is the difference between the purkinia fibers and the normal working myocardium in hard ventricles. So we don't know if this is left or right ventricle, but we know that here is the endocardium. So here is the inner space of the heart ventricle. Here does the blood flow. 
the surface, the inner surface of the heart chamber, heart ventricle, is lined with endothelium. There is a subendothelial connective tissue together forming a layer called endocardium. And here below the endocardium, there are, the, there are these huge, lightly stained special muscle, muscle, cardiac muscle cells called Purkinje cells or Purkinje fibers. Sorry, not Purkinje cells, because if you say Purkinje cell in histology, everybody starts thinking about the Purkinje cells, which are neurons in the second layer of the cortex of cerebellum. That was the same guy, but make sure you use the word Purkinje fibers in this context of the specialized cardiac muscle cells. It's a little bit misleading, but it's the terminology. So you can see they are really large in diameter and lighter than the regular working myocardium. So uh, here are uh, cardiac uh, muscle cells from the atria and the atrial cardiac muscle cells are able to release some hormones and uh, and uh, especially this hormone is called one of these hormones is called atrial natriuretic uh, peptide and uh, uh, it it supports uh, the the uh, excretion of sodium and water in by the kidney and it prevents overloading of the of the heart by too much uh, circulating blood volume, which is called volemia, hypervolemia. Because this uh, atrial pept natriuretic peptide is released um, upon being stimulated by too much dilation during the filling phase of the cardiac cycle. So if the atria uh, are facing uh, large volumes of blood coming into the atria uh, during the, the diastole, they are producing these hormones. You will discuss the consequences in, in physiology. Here for histology classes, uh, we want you to know that the function of cardiac muscle is not just to contract or propagate the action, action potentials. There could be also endocrine function in the atria. Yeah. This is an interesting picture showing briefly what happens when you deprive the cardiac muscle cells of the oxygen. So this is a healthy myocardium. And when there is a myocardial ischemia, ischemia is, is low oxygen supply. You can see <clears throat> that um, is, is the, during the first day, uh, uh, the contractile apparatus is disorganized. The nuclei look strange. They are so-called pycnotic. They are small and dense. And the cardiac muscle cells start to die. And this is already after three days of the myo uh, infarction of myocardium. There are dead cells where, and there is inflammatory infiltration. These are leukocytes here. Okay, smooth muscle cells. Uh, you can see the oval uh, edges of the nucleus. You don't see any sarcomeres here, even on the electromicrograph. Uh, electromicrograph. You can see the dense bodies that serves as attaching sites for the actin. And you can, here the reconstruction tries to suggest how the actin and myosin molecules are distributed across the cells in three, three dimensions. This is the smooth muscle in routine microscopic slides, as you will see it in our practical classes. So this is a longitudinal section through the smooth muscle. This is from the wall of ureter. Okay, here is also smooth muscle cells in the wall of a, of, a, of an arteriole. I see like one or two layers of smooth muscle cells here. It helps the arteriole to, to contract, which is called vasoconstriction. Here is another example of smooth muscle. Well, you don't see the cell borders pretty much, do you? It's much more difficult than on the schemes. So the only that remains is to look at the nuclei. The nuclei will tell you where the cell borders approximately might be. We see longitudinal section through smooth muscle cells, and we see 
smooth muscle cells, how they look like on a cross section. So obviously this organ has two layers, at least two layers of smooth muscle cells. And these two layers are perpendicular to each other. Uh, this happens in organs that uh, are able to perform peristalsis, peristaltic movements that require these two perpendicular systems of, of contracting uh, smooth muscle. This occurs in, in, in GIT, in, in, in intestines, in the ureter, or, or in the oviduct, in the fallopian tube, for example, or in the, in the esophagus, well, it's part of GIT. Now, if, if we see that this is the surface of the, of the organ, then we have an inner layer and outer layer. It could be a little bit misleading. Uh, use the word longitudinal muscle layer and longitudinal section, because there will be two possible meanings. We, we, as histologists, we would say this is a longitudinal section through smooth the smooth muscle, and this is a cross-section through the smooth muscle cells. But it doesn't tell us what is the orientation of the muscle layer from the anatomical perspective. Because, well, the label says it's from the wall of the appendix. And in the intestines, in the small and large intestine, you probably know from anatomy that there are really two smooth muscle layers, but the inner one is circular, and the outer external is longitudinal. It's running parallel to the long axis. Now, depending on how you cut the organ, you can get various sections of these anatomical layers in your, section, in your histological sections. So although this is a longitudinal section through the smooth muscle, this is actually a circular, circular inner layer of that. Uh, tunica muscularis. And this is the outer longitudinal layer in the anatomical meaning of the word, but we see it as a cross section. So you, we need to think about the dimensions and terminology here. If you make a very, very, very thin histological section, you can even see the cell borders, but you don't see it usually on the routine section. So the shape of the smooth muscle cells would be called spindle, spindle shaped cells, it's spindle shaped cells, and longitudinal sections and on cross sections. You can see the nucleosis in the center, okay? Uh, this explains uh, the formation of the caveolae, which are like uh, uh, invaginations of the plasma membrane uh, that happen during the pinocytosis, the cell drinking, and this is a decision scheme, algorithm or a scheme that points your uh, attention towards the differences and similarities between the skeletal, cardiac, and smooth muscle. Here is the graphic form of it, just recapitulating all the information we have been discussing during this class. So you can see the skeletal, cardiac, and smooth muscle. Okay. And uh, that will be it. And if you are uh, working on your own, you are at home, you are trying to catch up with histology, you are studying using various lectures, you are asking yourselves, what should I know? What should you know after this lecture, after you have your practical class on this topic, after you read a textbook um, or a chapter in your textbook or atlas, you want to check if you're ready for the exam. You, you, can, you are curious about what can be discussed during the exam, what the teachers might ask you, and what you remember for your future studies in, in medicine. That's, what, that's why we have prepared the learning outcomes for you. And they are available on this web address. And this is how it looks for today's lecture. It's one page summarizing all the important terms and telling you what you should be able to, to explain, draw, compare, explain, predict. So if you have some problems with this um, after going through the lit lit literature, uh, feel free to ask your teachers on your practical classes, or you can ask me. 
uh, next time. Uh, and that's that's it. Oh, sorry, here is the wrong date. The next lecture will be on the April 21st. And it will be it will be a uh, nerve tissue. Now I will check the chat window if there are some problems or questions from the from the students. I don't see any. So okay. So if you need to discuss something related to histology, we we oh you're right. Sorry about the dates. You're right. It must be Wednesday, April 22nd. <laughs> Thanks. Um, some students ask about the conditions, how to get a credit. So it's literally prepared these days to be published for the students. It's quite complicated, but basically nothing changed uh, from the previous week. And uh, uh, I hope you, sh you should. You sh it, this should be published, like in in to the end of the, by the end of the April. Should we send you the presentation? Of, oh yeah, uh, uh, the students from my group. Uh, we made a presentation. Uh, if you need some feedback, it would be nice if you send it uh, to me or uh, Professor Neveral. By the way, I will end the recording now.